Hello and welcome to Interpreting India. Geopolitical realignments, sustainable growth, healthcare financing, inclusive digital transformations, climate change, supply chain disruptions, urbanization, and several other critical global matters envelop the world as India hosts the G20 presidency. We at Carnegie India continue to bring voices from India and around the world to examine the role of technology, the economy, and international security in shaping India's future. My name is Anirudh Verman, and I will be your host for this episode of Interpreting India. In today's episode, we will be looking at the effect of reforms in the real estate sector on housing prices. The Real Estate Regulation Act was introduced in 2016 to protect consumers who had invested in residential real estate projects from malpractices by real estate developers. This was due to increasing complaints of consumers about delays in project completion, non-delivery of housing, and substandard execution. After the act was passed, most states established real estate regulatory authorities to register and oversee the conduct of real estate developers. In today's episode, we will examine how this regulatory change has benefited consumers. To give us insight into these issues, I'm delighted to be speaking with Dr. Vaidehi Tindale and Dr. Sahil Gandhi. Vaidehi and Sahil are economists who currently teach at the University of Manchester. Both of them conduct research in areas of urban economics, real estate, housing, political economy, and public finance with a focus on India. Their research has been published in reputed journals such as the Journal of Urban Economics, the Journal of Regional Science, Cities, Environment and Urbanization, among others. Both of them have worked extensively on real estate markets in India and in Mumbai specifically, and have followed the implementation of the Real Estate Regulation Act in Maharashtra. In today's episode, we will discuss their recent working paper studying how housing prices change in response to mandatory disclosures under the Real Estate Regulation Act. Their paper is titled, Do Mandatory Disclosures Squeeze the Lemons? The Case of Housing Markets in India. Vadehi, Sahil, welcome to Carnegie India. It's a pleasure to be on you. Hi, thanks for having us here. Sahil, Vadehi, before we start uh, getting into the paper itself, could you help set the context for the Real Estate Regulation Act? What were some of the problems in the real estate market in the early parts of the 2000s, in the 2010s? And what were the set of circumstances in which this law was enacted? Oh, where do we start when it comes to problems in housing? It's a, there were so many uh, problems. And uh, so basically the home buyer is putting in a lot of wealth in, uh, and putting in a lot of savings when it comes to purchasing a home, but is unsure of what they are purchasing. There, there is some uncertainty about the quality of the unit that they are going to buy. And what exactly do I mean by quality? So in 1970, George Akerlof started, wrote this paper, uh, The Market for Lemons, Quality, Uncertainty and the Market Mechanism. It was published in the Quarterly Journal of Economics. And he mentioned that a lot of markets have information asymmetry, where the sellers know much more than the buyers. And the, so it, he spoke a lot about the cars, the, the credit market, uh, and, and he gave examples uh, showing that uh, when the sellers have more uh, information, there will be information asymmetry in the market, which will lead to mispricing. Uh, of the of the commodity which is being sold because the lemons uh, will not be identifiable from the non lemons which will lead to mispricing now this is exactly what happens in the real estate uh, market especially when it comes to india now one part of the paper spoke about dishonesty and one line of akelop's paper is dishonesty in business is a serious problem problem in underdeveloped countries and India is one uh, case where uh, there is a lot of businesses that are happening where there is dishonesty. And real estate is one such, uh, one such market. Now, the kinds of information asymmetry that exist in, uh, in real estate have to do with the title of land. The developer knows whether the land has a clear title or not, whether they have all the permissions taken from the authority because we know that Developers have to go through a lot of uh, lot of authorities to get permission. 
So there will always be some places where they might not have gotten permission on time and they are a little ambiguous about it to the buyer. Uh, the seller would also know whether how much is allowed to build. Uh, if, if formally they've been given uh, 10 floors to build, but they land up building actually 12 floors. So those two floors are illegal. That information the seller possesses, but the buyer does not know. And another thing which happens a lot in India's real estate is how long does it take to complete a project? The, the seller knows that the project might take one, uh, four years to complete, but actually communicates to the buyer that it, they would take one year to complete. And in the process, the buyer puts in all the savings to purchase the house. So these are some of uh, the problems in India's real estate. Vaidhi, I don't know if you want to come in here. Uh, yeah, just another sort of few other problems, again, that we know anecdotally and also through, you know, newspaper reports uh, that come in every other day are uh, issues of, you know, outright like fraudulent practices. So it's not just about as information asymmetry, but also mismanagement perhaps of construction finance where money is taken but not used for the purpose of building the project, but is instead used in other speculative ways. Um, and that sort of a practice has also been rampant. So in order to curtail this so and bring about information, a, a symmetry of information, so bring about greater transparency uh, and also sort of protect the customers and promote the industry as a whole, because if the industry cleans up its act, then, you know, it, it will see better growth and, and you know, better uh, investments in general. So with a view f towards achieving all of this, you know, there was some need for a regulation of the sector, uh, which uh, historically or, you know, we, we have seen being regulated in other countries as well. So it's not something that is new to India, uh, but it's something that was a long time coming. Yeah, and around this time, we were also seeing this construction and real estate boom and lots of new entrants in the market. And the problem that both of you are posing is that if you have a builder, how do you know whether he or she will be actually able to deliver? And so I think the, that phase of rapid expansion of the market, there was that additional problem of this huge new set of firms who were promising to you know, deliver on new housing and you just had no way to judge whether they would actually be able to deliver or not. Was that was that something that you also witnessed? So there is um, non-delivery because of, I think, on two or three counts. The first would probably be just like outright, you know, uh, builders who don't have enough experience and who've come in and, and mismanage projects either knowingly or unknowingly and then, uh, you know, run away with people's money and then there's a lot of litigation involved. The other cases of non-delivery could be due to, um, well, not exactly non-delivery, but delays, you know, and substantial delays and significant delays brought about by various factors, including, say, uh, delays in permissions, as, as Sahil mentioned, there's so many permissions and uh, that authorities uh, that have to be taken from authorities. And if there are delays, then that ends up dealing your project. If there are multiple revisions needed in the plans, um, then again, that will extend the project timelines and that in increases um project completions. And we do find that, I mean, at least in the data that we have looked at, on average, the, the time to completion of real estate projects in Indian cities is quite high compared to, you know, say the more mature markets of the United States and the United Kingdom. Right. And so this was basically the context in which uh, we had this demand for some kind of a regulation of real estate players and uh, Concurrently, we were also seeing this other big legislative change, uh, the Indian Bankruptcy Court, which again became a forum under which a lot of real estate investors went to try and recoup their investment. So these two big changes in the real estate industry were happening side by side. So uh, I'm more familiar with the IBC because that's about looking at how to recoup your investments from a firm that's basically gone bankrupt or is technically bankrupt now. So what were the big changes that RERA tried to bring in? So um, 
I think the process of setting up a, the or passing the regulation was, has been underway since 2011, which was when the central government first came up with the real estate uh, regulation and development bill. Um, and then in 2012, actually, the government of Maharashtra also had a Maharashtra housing regulation and development bill, uh, which then it subsequently was passed in the assembly, but then it was awaiting a central government approval. But then the government itself, uh, you know, came up with another draft bill in 2013. And then subsequently, the Real Estate uh, Regulation and Development Act was passed in 2016. So that was, it's been uh, tweaked a fair amount of times in order to, uh, you know, ensure that uh, the act at least meets its objectives of uh, ensuring that home buyers are protected and also that uh, you know if there are any sorts of malpractices then the real estate developers are sort of penalized uh, appropriately um so the some of the key features of the act uh, involve uh, asking all state governments to set up a real estate regulatory authority within one year's time so once the act was passed in 2016 Every state was expected to have a regulatory authority in place. All uh, real estate projects uh, of a certain size, so sizes were 500 square meters or more than eight apartments if it's a multifamily housing. Um, So all such projects had to register with this real estate regulatory authority. Uh, This involved providing a bunch of information to the authority in terms of uh, the kinds of permissions that have been received, uh, features of the project, what are the number of flows and so on, and also having uh, providing information on the kind of uh, litigations or disputes um, that the project could be under. Uh, There was also, uh, and, and this required in some cases actually providing proofs of the different uh, certificates and so on. So uh, different states have set up the authorities. And uh, the other thing that uh, has to be uh, done uh, is, as I mentioned, uh, making sure that the financial mismanagement is taken, is addressed through the act. So the act requires every uh, developer who is registered with the project or uh, they have to have a separate escrow account and all the money that's collected for the project uh, has to go into that account and up to 70% is used to finance the construction and land cost of that project um so that the money is used and and uh, at as the project reaches different stages of completion they're allowed to take out money from the account and use it towards financing the the next stages of of completion so uh, that was another feature of this act which uh, sort of helped bring about some discipline in in how developers were managing their finance. Um, If I've missed out anything, Sahil, you can add. But there is one more point that I'll add is that there is some variation across the states in terms of when the act was set up and also the kind of information that developers are required to disclose. There's also, I don't know if you mentioned uh, that... uh, the authority can penalize uh, developers if the projects are delayed. So if the developer says that I'm going to complete a project in 2025 and they delay that, then the authority can come down and say that you need to pay some interest on the amount to the buyer, etc. So there is some, uh, what do you call, uh, contract enforcement uh, when it comes to the date of uh, delivery so which i think is important and another thing that happened is that uh, whenever developers advertise their projects they have to provide the rara numbers so in a way that uh, the buyers can then uh, check information about uh, these projects before making a purchase having the rara number on the advertisement does not mean that the project is good it is finally then goes to the buyer to find out more information about uh, that uh, project. Right. Yeah, so I think RERA basically has created two systems. One is created some system of regulation and minimum standards. And the other is this idea of at least putting out some basic level of information about the project. And 
I'll take up Vaidhi's point on the level of variation between states, and you guys have both focused a lot on Mumbai and Maharashtra. And anecdotally, but also if you look at the website of the Maharashtra era, it's got a far more information. It's generally reputed to be one of the more active real estate regulatory authorities. So, any insights on? what's made the maharashtra era much more active compared to the others is it just the fact that the land market is uh, generally more sophisticated the real estate values are higher and therefore the stakes are higher or is it just the fact that the buyers are also more sophisticated and demand better information or is it just about leadership and individuals within the organization any any insights on this actually this is a this is a question that i'm still thinking about so i don't have a concrete answer to that because i was very 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 surprised when all of this information came up online for maharashtra given the fact that you know that there is a lot of black money involved in uh, real estate and the uh, and the politicians make a lot of money out of this uh, black money so i was very surprised so so all all the reasons that you mentioned any one of them could be uh, true or a combination of uh, them could be true so i don't have a concrete answer to that i think there's also some indication with the fact that it was also this only state way back in 2012 to float a similar act so there must have been some sort of political um, you know Uh, politically there might people would have been willing to um take the step of regulating the sector um but yeah i mean in, you know your guess is as good as ours i guess yeah because when i see the level of variation it's quite striking i mean i'm in, based in delhi and delhi is an equally expensive if not transparent real estate market but the level of information that you find on the rera website is is uh, i mean it's almost non existent compared to maharashtra but but on that point and coming closer to your paper itself one of the points of variation is the information regarding litigation and that's uh, that's something that has been there on the maharashtra rera website and you've also done some previous work on litigation so i was uh, quite i mean astounded to read the proportion of i mean disputes uh, in the in the paper that you mentioned and i think it's close to 30% if i'm correct uh, and 48% sorry you said 38% of the new real estate projects in mumbai are employed in legal disputes so that's a it's a pretty high number um is there something peculiar to india or mumbai or is it something that you will see in most emerging economies um so this is definitely a case where mumbai both uh, the district and uh, the city and the suburbs are uh, somewhat of an outlier because we looked at the data for maharashtra as a whole and uh, for maharashtra as a whole i think the numbers are much smaller so it's 16% um of the total projects back in 2018 which was when we uh, you know had collected all the data for all the projects that had registered back then and 16% of the projects were under litigation so for maharashtra is way above the average uh, sorry mumbai is way above the average and uh, not just in terms of the number of projects so 30% of the number of projects of course are under litigation but we see nearly 50% of the total built up area that's coming up so uh, in the city is under some sort of a legal dispute so that has implications and i think as uh, as to the question of why mumbai seems to have been such a massive outlier i suppose it's also because the construction sector and the real estate markets in mumbai are just another level of crazy so there's another you know there's lots more um, sophisticated ways in which people are uh, trying to 
game the system you know there's lots of regulatory pressures to already sort of which already have a constraint on how much you can build so perhaps there's a lot of um, discretion or use of discretion or sort of subverting of rules and so on which then exposes projects to litigation from say public interest litigations or from civil society and so on um so perhaps that could be one reason why we see mumbai seeing a lot more uh, litigation so bigger cities uh, in maharashtra tend to have more proportion of their projects under litigation bombay mumbai being the biggest city has the highest percentage but you do see trends uh, you do see high numbers in pune nasik uh, uh, navi mumbai so all of these cities also have uh, substantial uh, percentage under litigation but not as much as 30% bigger cities have more litigation and bigger projects tend to get litigated uh, more uh, so those are the two facts the number uh, surprised us as well uh, anirudh and we were like taken aback oh that's the problem when it comes to real estate in india like 30 to 40% of the project for big cities uh, uh, is in uh, under litigation now i would think that uh, delhi might also have similar numbers it's just that we don't know uh, because this does not exist uh, on the portal. Uh, UP also has problems with uh, real estate, as you know about the whole uh, Twin Towers coming down. And uh, in fact, that project had a litigation against it, like way back. Uh, there was the civil society that filed a litigation, and which eventually it went through a lot of courts, and then it, it got, uh, uh, like the court uh, said that we need to get rid of these uh, projects. but. UP still does not have a place of litigation on their website despite going through all of this, which was shocking to us. Like if if those twin towers came up right now, the buyers wouldn't know that uh, this project has uh, a problem. Yeah, it was shocking because they went ahead and built the towers in spite of the litigation. They were, quite a lot of it was sold off. It was some of it was occupied. Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, quite surprising the amount they managed to get away with. Um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it really explains a lot if half the built-up, uh, if half the space that's going to come up in Mumbai is under litigation. It really also explains a lot about the cost of these projects, right? Because at least implicitly, you have to deal with that cost of litigation, either through delays or, or I mean, just the funding the cost of the actual litigation. Yeah, absolutely. Like the cost just escalates. The developers don't know how they are going to manage uh, uh, delays. And that's perhaps one of the reasons that you see a lot of mismanagement of funds uh, because they have to figure out their whole cash flow uh, situation. And uh, so let's come more directly to this paper because it sheds a lot of interesting light on the role that regulation has had on at least on housing prices and some of these issues. Uh, so tell me a little bit about this paper. Why did you think about working on this, and what was the what was the main focus of the paper? So, as we mentioned before, one of the ru- aims of RERA was to bring about greater transparency in the sector, and it decided to change the rules of the game by um, making mandatory disclosures by sellers about the quality of their projects, the type of their projects and other information related to their projects publicly available. So now sellers can, uh, you know, buyers are better informed and they're able to see uh, in better details about what is the nature of the project that they are buying. And because they're more aware now, uh, we would see some dif- differences in in the kind of pricing of the projects. So um, just to sort of you know, be a little bit more legal, you know, use some legal terms uh, for for the, you know, for those who may be interested. We sort of sh- saw a shift from like, a, you know, caveat vendor to, ca- uh, sorry, caveat emptor laws to caveat vendor laws. So b- basically now it was the onus was on the seller to disclose information and uh, the buyers therefore could have access to better information. And this asymmetry that existed earlier was no longer in place. So we 
exploited two things. Firstly, we knew or we had information about prices of projects before Rera came into place, which was in 2017 in the, in Mumbai, and prices of real estate projects in uh, post implementation of Rera. So, what the hypothesis here was that before Rera was introduced sellers or oh sorry potential home buyers had no information about whether a project was litigated or not as a result of which the prices of litigated units were not distinguishable from the prices of non litigated units what happened post is now that sellers are giving information about whether or not their projects are litigated buyers can make an informed choice and what that could lead to is maybe there is a fall in the demand of litigated units um or because there is now a transparent risk associated with a litigated unit there is a discounted price that is now associated with the litigated unit at the same time uh, non litigated units may see a higher demand um and they may see a premium because uh, these projects are uh, of a signal that they are of better quality and uh, home buyers are willing to pay a premium to move to these project projects so before and after what we see is essentially no difference between litigated units before and after we see a separation so we see two different uh, price points emerging one for litigated uh, units and the other for non litigated units and our hypothesis is that uh, the litigated units would be lower uh, selling at lower prices and non litigated units would be selling at a higher price so this is how we set up the study and uh, using the data that we collected we were actually able to test these hypotheses uh, in the paper so i mean what did you find so the main result w- is that uh, post the implementation of rera we see the prices of litigated units being about 5 to 6% lower than the prices of non litigated units so something that we had hypothesized earlier uh, i mean in in the fr- uh, framing of the study is you know we do see evidence for that in uh, in the study but we can talk about this later because uh, we can talk about this more in detail um, is the fact that this uh, is not uniform so the price differential ex- is different across different sub markets and for different types of buyers okay can you explain this a little bit more what is the kind of differentiation you are seeing so uh, we got we were able to classify projects into luxury uh, housing and non luxury housing and the way we did that is by looking at the amenities that were provided in these uh, in these housing projects so if a project had a swimming pool gymnasium then you would assume that that's a luxury project and if they didn't have these amenities then it's a non luxury uh, project so the kind of buyers that were purchasing units would be very different in a luxury housing unit as a project as compared to a non luxury housing uh, project so what we find is that the mandatory disclosure law and in this case rera only had an impact in the non luxury housing market and not in the luxury housing market so it led to a 6% fall of the lemons or the litigated units for only the non luxury housing market and it had basically no impact and that at first surprised us we were like okay so it only had an impact on non luxury why is the luxury market not responding to this and what we realized is that the the home buyers of luxury units pre rera already had information about the litigation uh, status they already knew if a uh, project has litigation or not and even before rera they were giving uh, discounted prices for litigated uh, units in luxury uh, market and this was not happening in the non luxury uh, market the home buyers did not know if the project had litigation or not in the pre rera stage so what we found because of this result is that uh, rera not only reduced information asymmetry in the housing market but it also reduced inequity in access to information in the housing uh, market yeah so basically people in the higher income segment had their own resources to do some kind of due diligence on 
whether this property was under litigation and so on. Whereas it was the more middle to lower middle class segment that actually lacked these resources. Exactly. Like they would have access to uh, lawyers. They would like lawyers are quite costly to uh, hire to get all of this uh, information. So these resources were only available to uh, uh, to buyers of luxury units. Then sometimes luxury projects uh, details are also available in newspapers. There could be uh, some newspaper saying that so and so project is uh, coming under litigation. So immediately. Uh, home buyers would know that this project has some form of litigation and we should not perhaps purchase uh, in this uh, at this uh, relevant uh, price at this given price this is what, how we hypothesize uh, buyers ac- uh, across the two different submarkets could have had access to different information um, there is of course uh, some question about you know whether there was different severity of litigation across the two submarkets, which is why we may be seeing different outcomes altogether. For instance, you know, could we could the litigation in uh, the luxury markets be more severe uh, as compared to the the litigation in the low in the low or low income or non luxury submarket? Uh, we tested for that. So we, because we knew which court the dispute was being heard in, we sort of created a measure of severity of litigation uh, where we looked at uh, projects that whose cases were being heard at the high court and the Supreme Court were considered to be more severe um, as compared to projects with litigation where the cases were being heard in the lower courts. It's an imperfect measure, but we don't have much information about the exact nature of dispute. So we had to work with what we had. And uh, even when we sort of control for the severity of litigation, we find that, uh, you know, the, the results continue to hold. So, you know, even in if you just compare apples to apples, so severely litigated projects in the non-luxury and the severely litigated projects in the luxury submarkets, you, you'd you still see that in the non-luxury submarkets, um, this price differential persists. So, um, yeah, so that's that's one way that we try to address this uh, potential wrinkle in the, in the analysis. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. And while you were explaining this, I was thinking about your earlier point that sort of there's in some sense, higher contestation about about land and real estate, the more expensive and valued the real estate project gets. And yet we don't see any discount in the, in the value of the real estate project for the higher income segments, which is, which is somewhat, I mean, counterintuitive. Or, I mean, there seems to be something more going on. Either these people have already discounted that value, right? Or, or I mean, they think that that litigation is not severe enough to actually hamper their investment. Am I am I drawing the right conclusions from this? I don't think so because they've already discounted for it. So, uh, so then they could there wouldn't be any more impact because the price is already controlled for lemons and non lemons in the pre rera uh, period. So. I'm not uh, sure if uh, that uh, holds because that, uh, finally, I see the point you're making because if, if you're assuming that these are in- institutional buyers who are investing in real estate, delays would not matter because even if they get the property four years down the line, it's fine because uh, they don't want to anyways uh, stay in it. They never wanted to sell it in, in a small period of time. I'm My gut tells me that... Uh, I'm not sure uh, litigation should matter, but I, I can, I, being contrary, and I can also find that there could be an argument in what you are making as well. So, yeah, I mean, it, so I can find equally strong arguments from both sides. So even if you are an investor, at the end of the day, you want a clean asset. You don't want you know something that's heavily litigated on your balance sheet. So there is an incentive to not have litigation or to, I mean, discount for the value of litigation. Uh, on the other hand, the data that you've put together seems to indicate that that discount has already happened implicitly. 
Exactly. So the fact that the buyers already knew the information about uh, litigation status in the pre rera period, they already discounted for it. And they gave a risk adjusted price for a unit in litigation properties. <coughs> The other point that struck me while whether he was explaining you know, the findings of this paper was, if you say that uh, in the say lower to in the non-luxury segment housing prices drop by around five to six percent, could you make the argument that five to six percent is the cost of litigation imposed on a real estate project? And can you can you make that argument, or is it is it improper to make that argument? Because then you can actually provide insurance or something like that to cover for the loss of it. It's sort of like the risk-adjusted price of the unit. So yeah, I think you can think of it like that. It's interesting because I was thinking of uh, things like title insurance that I've worked on before. And if you were able to compute, say, the cost of litigation across projects, then you can actually get much more meaningful data on what the insurance premium should be. Right. Whereas right now you're basically operating in the dark. Yeah, that that makes sense. Another thing that uh, this paper really brings out is that there is, I mean, really an asymmetric effect on uh, on households that are lower down the income income ladder in terms of the cost of information availability. So, um, goes back to the lemon problem that you were explaining earlier. So um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Because one of the implications of RERA seems to be that it's much more pro-poor or pro-middle class than you know some people expected it to be. Yeah, we do find that uh, the uh, within the income quartiles, the, the quartile with the, low, the least income saw the greatest impact on prices, which basically means that because of RERA, the fall in prices was around 10% for litigated units for the, the lowest income quartile. There was no impact on the highest uh, income quartile, uh, no, no significant impact. And, and it moved from 10% for the least uh, income quartile, which is quartile 4, it moved to around 7% uh, for quartile 3 to around 4% for quartile 2 and then zero, like no impact on it. So there's this neat trend that we were saying, uh, seeing that as incomes fell, the the impact on property prices was uh, much more due to RERA. And uh, we were first surprised with the results, but then when you think about it, it does make sense that uh, uh, the the riskiness of the asset was much more for uh, the uh, for for the poorer sections of the society. They were paying much higher for litigated units in the pre rera period, which basically means that they had no access to information relative to the other quartiles. So it did. Uh, it does look like that it is very very uh, pro poor. And RERA is uh, not only reducing information asymmetry, to repeat the point, it's, it's reducing the inequity in access to information across uh, buyers, which is a strong uh, takeaway from uh, the, this, like the mandatory disclosure law does uh, level the playing field across uh, buyers. Yeah, and in terms of, I mean, more public policy kind of jargon, it also has an impact on affordability because it is having a much more outsized effect for kind of lower income segments. But the same property is much more affordable by 10% or so than it was in the pre rera period. I actually wouldn't uh, take it like that, Anirudh, because uh, it's, it's uh, the property prices are falling, no doubt, uh, but finally it's the it is still a litigated property. So when we look at purchasing real estate, we look at it as a bundle of attributes is what the buyer is buying, which is the the amenities that are provided in a housing society, uh, the location of the housing society, whether it has good uh, water connection, solid waste management, storage, and whether if the title is clear. So these are all the different things a home buyer is buying into. And if the title has a problem or if the project has some kind of litigation, then the willingness to pay for that housing would be uh, lower, which is not the same thing as saying that if this did not have a litigation, then uh, 
the prices are still uh, fallen. So it's just controlling for these factors. We find that the prices uh, got it. Yeah, yeah. No, that makes absolute sense. Yeah. The other question I had was. Uh, so when you think of 5% and you think of a litigation dispute, it, I mean, the assumption for me is that if it's stuck in litigation, there is a high probability that I'll never get my property, right? So then why is the decrease only 5%? Right? That was something that I was thinking about. Should we see a bigger fall in in the prices that has been that are being asked? And again, that goes back to the severity of litigation question that uh, he was making. So can you explain a little bit more about what is the kind of litigation you are seeing uh, around these properties? And also, so because that might help clarify why we are seeing a 5 to 6% drop and not a sharp one. So uh, there is, this is an average effect. So, you know, you could uh, see in some cases, again, by severity or much bigger drop versus, um, you know, less severe cases. I think the other set of information we can potentially exploit, though we have not done for this study, is the number of cases. So I think what the RERA website also shows is, the number of cases that a project is uh, embroiled in and we can potentially look at the variation and see whether the prices may uh, the price drop may be higher for uh, you know those with more number of cases which would have uh, more delays and potentially you know more chances of the project not being completed altogether um, so that's something that is you know it's an interesting question we you know and we can potentially see uh, the these different types of litigation related attributes and look at the price differentials across uh, so uh, exploit the heterogeneity in the in the nature of litigation in terms of the nature of the disputes themselves unfortunately you know we don't have that data as i mentioned before so what we broadly know is yes a lot of the projects are boundary disputes, land disputes, those sorts of uh, disputes between different um, parties. There's also cases of encroachments on land and, you know, that leading to uh, legal disputes. There are a lot of public interest litigation related disputes also where sort of maybe uh, RWA or some civil society actors um, are wanting to preserve maybe the heritage precincts or the environmental sort of quality of their neighborhoods and want to oppose some development. So we have anecdotally seen or, you know, cases or instances of that happening. So I think that's broadly the two uh, types of litigation that we'd see. Uh, We wouldn't be able to classify all the different types, but these definitely... So the public interest litigations and the land uh, and boundaries and encroachments and all of those related disputes certainly do crop up more often than the others. Yeah, this question is, I mean, if land titling is perennially interesting and at almost all times we hit upon a roadblock on how to think about land litigation beyond a point. But this is uh, this is such... I mean, such a fascinating discussion and such a great paper because it lends itself to so many downstream questions and downstream areas of exploration. So because we are drawing to a close, I just wanted to ask you, both of you have been doing this kind of work for a while now. You've written extensively, published quite a lot. What are the, A, what are the next steps in terms of how you want to take this research forward? But also, what are some of the big questions as urban economists Looking at India, what are some of the questions you either want to work on or wish somebody else was working on? So I think the one straight up question that comes from all the RERA work is how it has changed the the real estate market. Uh, Which means that has our new projects coming into development with uh, the coming into new development, do they have lower litigation? Are are developers being careful about the kind of land titles that they're purchasing? Uh, Are they being more transparent with the uh, the permission process so that if if they're being more transparent about the permissions and they're making sure that 
if all permissions come in, then we'll start the project, which means that they are less likely to be litigated. So eventually the litigation probability falls across all uh, projects. So are we seeing that? Are we also seeing if RERA has led to a fall in completion times of uh, projects overall, like pre-RERA, post-RERA? So is that a possible, uh, like if, if RERA has reduced times from five years of construction to three years of construction time, that's a massive impact. And I would love to see a study uh, on that, but that's the big impact of uh, RERA. So just to jump in here, uh, I think we didn't address this directly, but uh, we do find a limitation of RERA, which is that it cannot, it does not have any jurisdiction over other authorities that are giving permission. So um, if there are delays because, uh, you know, sim- there's just the the concerned authority is just sitting on an application and not providing approvals over time, uh, uh, timely approvals, then we are not going to see a massive change in projects being completed faster. So there's definitely, um, you know, more, uh, there's, there is more scope for tweaking the rules uh, pertaining to RERA so that it can work together with the different authorities in order to streamline and maybe, you know, shorten the processes of permissions uh, that are given to uh, to developers for their real estate projects. Um, so, yeah, just wanted to jump in there. Sorry, Sai, you can, you can continue. So there's also other lines of work of uh, related to climate change. We know that... Uh, and natural disasters, climate change and natural disasters. We know that uh, there could be severity in terms of temperature. There would be more flooding that's going to happen in South Asia. And that could lead to massive uh, financial risks for households and the banking sector. Uh, so are, are we seeing some form of adaptation that's happening against these uh, financial risks when it comes to uh, the housing uh, and the real estate uh, market? Are the insurance markets coming up? Are we seeing banks uh, giving higher interest rates in more flood-prone uh, areas? So these are possible areas of research that we'll be diving into. Uh, there is a lot of uh, talk about urbanization leading to an improvement in quality of life for people. Like as people move in from uh, villages to cities, uh, yeah, hopefully their lives are going to improve, their utilities uh, will go up. But are we actually seeing that if for the case of India? It's an open uh, question. We don't know. We don't have answers to that. And that's an interesting line of research to take forward. It's a difficult one because you need a very good uh, identification strategy for this. But uh, it's, it is it is an important one for a country like uh, uh, India, where you are going to be seeing a lot of organization taking place. Thank you for this. This has been a great conversation. and. I agree. Climate change and both quality of living, they're going to be very important. And I think all of us saw a recent paper on the patterns of residential segregation in urban India recently. So I think themes like that will continue to be important and relevant. But thank you for this discussion. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Sahil. I think. This was a great conversation, Anirudh. Thank you for having us. Thank you. It was a great pleasure to be here. We'll be back in two weeks with a new episode. To make sure you don't miss it, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts from. To learn more about our research and team, you can visit us at carnegieindia.org. You can also find us on social media on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Thank you for listening. See you next time.